Hello and welcome to TP's uh, today webinar by TP Oral Hygiene Products uh, shared on our TP Share platform. Very warm welcome to everyone. My name is Elaine Tilling and I'm dental hygienist in the Royal Air Force, no longer in the Royal Air Force, uh, in the United Kingdom. I work for TP full time. I'm the clinical education and projects manager for the UK team. Today we're going to be sharing um, or my experience really in smoking in the world of smoking cessation as part of health reduction um uh, shall i start again it's very early here just after six in the morning today i'm going to be sharing my experience in smoking cessation support for patients in practice and sharing some of the latest and slightly confusing data that we're being um fed really globally by um, the negative, uh, perhaps negative impacts of uh, using vapes as electronic cigarettes as part of smoking. So I'm going to share my screen because I'm aware that uh, the technology is better applied uh, with, with less applications open. So so do you mind if I vape? Well. Do we? Do we mind if our patients vape? I'm having a little bit of a hiccup up here with screen sharing, but here we go. For today's presentation, we'll have a look at the role of electronic cigarettes or vapes as a part of nicotine replacement therapy, as part of patients eventually giving up smoking. And we'll have a look at our current understanding of the general and oral health implications of the use and hopefully uh, combine this with our already fairly extensive understanding of health and healthy habits in the advice that we generally give day to day in, in regular practice. But when we leave today, I'd like us to have an understanding how e cigarettes do actually work and the controversy around their use, uh, and there is lots of controversy for sure but essentially be able to support patients who do wish to give up uh, using tobacco by using them. So at the start of this, um, uh, can I just remind everybody that uh, if they'd like to ask questions, um, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of this 45 minute session and please put them in the chat. Also at the end of this session, when we close, there will be an evaluation form that pops up um, which we'd be really appreciative if you could complete for us. This al allows us to reflect on, on what we've delivered today and also to improve what we deliver and how we deliver it. So I would ask, and I will remind you a little bit later on in the programme. This presentation, um, uh, which would, well, I've worked in smoking cessation over very, very many years, is great when it's interactive and you can have a look and play at some of the devices. But let's See if we can wander our way through this subject area and pick up what's relevant for you in everyday practice and maybe take home uh, some thoughts about what's really happening out there uh, in, in the world of tobacco use. I don't think we can start on uh, a subject area like, such as this if we don't remind ourselves of, of why electronic cigarettes have come into the market and um, year on year that the, the death rate from smoking remains high, too high, unacceptably high. Um, if we, you know, we do know that smoking has been a problem for us over many decades, decades, but for the entire 20th century, it's estimated around 100 million people died prematurely because of their smoking. And the health burden of smoking is shifting, seriously shifting from the high income to the low and middle income countries. And some estimates um, suggest that actually, one billion people could die from tobacco use over the 21st century. So if we look at the global burden of the disease and we look at the trends in smoking, it does help us to couch how and why we deliver smoking cessation and support in practice uh, and how electronic cigarettes can impact on that. Because when we look uh, at the statistics worldwide, one in five adults in the world still smoke men are still much more likely to smoke than women and what we do know is that taxing cigarettes controlling banning on advertising etc does help quit smoking and they're all critical to accelerate the decline of smoking and so if we 
think about the global burden of this disease of, of smoking as a as a habit think about the costs to life and to communities and think about what we do know that does actually work and it's about regulation and control and that's where this story really starts if i got you to do some a little bit of work and for many of you it's the evening it's the early hours of the morning for me so I, I if you thought about the three aspects if i said if i asked you all to think what are the three things that make smoking so in incredibly difficult to give up most of us would come up with addiction we do know that the, the addict it, smoking is addictive and it's the nicotine content in uh, tobacco that causes that addiction we also know it's hard to break because it's a habit and habits are uniquely hard to break and they're uniquely hard to start, particularly health, healthy habits. But the other third and, and quite important role or part of smoking and, and quitting smoking is the psychological dependency on something like a cigarette. Now that that is the trickiest one to tackle when we're advising patients to give up smoking in practice and, and everybody, all of us out there are aware of the uh, deleterious effects of smoking on the oral mucosa as well as the rest of, of the body. But the psychological dependency uh, and control that the patient exerts over themselves and their habit is a tough one to crack and psycho the psychological element of this is why the e-cigarettes actually come into play a little bit more because patients do have control over their pharmacotherapy that they're choosing to give up smoking. But it's just a plant, right? It's just a, a harmless plant. It's what us humans have done to it that's causing, uh, the, causing the problem here. So let's look at the stats for the United Kingdom. And if I listed all of these and these appeared on the 10 o'clock news for the United Kingdom, we often are told, sadly, of the suicide rates and death rates from fires uh, and, and uh, substance misuse. We're never told that actually, if we times those figures by five, that's how many are dying of smoking each year and continue to die uh, in, in our country. And if we look um, at, at the wider picture and look at the rate of smoking, um, we have a reduced rate of smoking in the, in the UK. It varies from 15.6 in some parts of our country, uh, but the average, the median is 14.1. And that's a reduction in the last 15 years of some 10%, which is massive. Still with 6.9 million smokers though, 77,000 deaths in 2019, 150,000 children and young people, that's young people below the age of 18, that start smoking regularly. 54% of which start before the age of 18, which is the scary statistic here. But the, 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 the big association here, and certainly for the, us in the dental care profession, is its association with squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity. And so still the by far the greatest proportion of patients presenting with mouth cancer, not oral pharyngeal, but with mouth cancers um, are, are associated with smokers. If I look at the uh, larger statistics um, for smoking, and specifically by country um, and, and Europe, uh, Europe remains high smokers and the Slavic areas remain the highest. Uh, the biggest growth in smoking uh, is in our uh, Asian communities and Chinese communities. But it's just a plant, right? So let's think about this plant and this habit and what we know about habit formation to help us couch how we'll put this into some kind of intervention in practice. And we we think about habit formation, certainly when I was trained many, many moons ago uh, in the military, uh, we were taught that habits uh, take roughly 21 days to form. So uh, our expectation of patients that we teach them how to brush, we disclose them, we teach them how to brush and they'd come back in two or three weeks time and actually developed the habit of remembering to do it twice a day. Uh, I think we all know that uh, <laughs> that's not so. Uh, and that was based on a little piece of evidence or, or data that was produced in the US. Uh, and it was in fact, a, a oral, uh, sorry, a cosmetic surgeon that looked at his patient's acceptance of their 
uh, cosmetic changes that, that that he undertook and it took them about three weeks to accept that that was their new lips or, or they were their new lips and that was their new nose so slightly dodgy data but one that we've 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 used over the years uh, more recently and so over the years as we've developed belief health belief models health efficacy models and behavior change models we know that the habit journey is a little bit more complex than that and we know that in in practice you know when we're giving oral hygiene advice for example uh, or advice to uh, to reduce their sugar in the diet etc we need a commitment from that patient we need to have some kind of uh, contract with that patient where they understand one what it is they've been asked to do and why and then needs to work then to change that behavior and in, in brushing and incidental cleaning we do know if we're asking a patient that they generally brush once or twice a day we're encouraging them to brush twice a day we know that any habit that we form has a cue we know that we usually associate it with this, uh, a location and when we're talking specifically about oral hygiene for and wish for example to include interdental cleaning then we would cue them in at the time they brush their teeth so when you're brushing normally at night like maybe last thing at night when you've got the most time of day perhaps introduce cleaning into densely. This habit journey works well uh, for us when we're talking about introducing any health behavior and it also works well when we're seeking to understand people's journeys in smoking. When we looked at the second component of why giving up smoking is so tricky is because habits are associated with cues. Here we're looking at it being a cue for health and for benefit, where the cue is brushing their teeth. Well, for smokers, the cue could be having a glass of wine on a Friday night. I'm sure that uh, most of us, when we're interviewing and speaking to our patients about their social histories as part of their uh, medical history, often smokers will say, well, I'm a social smoker. Um, what does that mean? It means actually they're cued to smoking at a time when they're out with their friends only. They don't pick up a cigarette in between, that, in between those times. They only do it in a social context. So understanding habit journeys through our general understanding of how we deliver and advise patients to change for the better can also help us when we're talking about an understanding when, they, when they're undertaking habits that are harmful to their health. When in the UK we looked at um, more information on how long does it take for a healthy habit, for example, uh, Pippa Lally and Gardner up in London at, the, at UCH in London looked at a group of patients where they were trying to encourage them to take on a healthy habit and remembering back to that cue, the important um, association between the a cue, a reminder to do something, they chose um, to increase the patient's fluid intake by, by adding it to something they did regularly, which, was, which in this case was mealtimes. And when they looked at how long it took for it to become habitual, and that's in as much when I'm, I talk about habitual, but what I mean is they'll miss the absence of it. They do it automatically. Um, it took anywhere between 18 and 245 days. So significantly longer for a great many uh, than our 21 days. So when we're encouraging patients to change, when we are in, ex we, we set expectations, maybe being mindful of if it takes between 18 to 245 days, now I'm going to ask for some audience participation with your cups of tea or evening time for many of you out there. How long would be the average time? Mathematicians amongst you, roughly 66 days. What does that mean when we're talking about health interventions? Well, if we think about when we are motivated as individuals to change behavior, to do something better, do something for us, the new year is the greatest time to do it. It's when we singularly decide that we're going to be better people, do something, get out running, whatever it is. So new year's resolutions, um, are the time that to instigate, start and change. And certainly in tobacco, lots of patients wish a better smoke, usually around the 70 to 78 percent mark each year when interviewed smokers will will suggest that they are motivated they would like to give up smoking so that so obviously the first first of january is a good time for them to start they set a they set a schedule they set a time in their diaries and uh, they they agree to to give up smoking that's their commitment if you go back to the uh the the habit cycle they've committed to give up smoking they've decided on the 
Uh, the last one is New Year's Eve at just about midnight, and they're not going to smoke anymore. But we knew, we all know uh, that with the best uh, intention, we fail. And so the New Year's resolutions at such a fail and about uh, March, uh, and I've jumped ahead of myself here, but we set in the United Kingdom National No Smoking Day for the second week in March deliberately because they've gone through, they I've given up, I've failed. Uh, and we set a target in far enough advance to just start thinking, or well, maybe, okay, let's set it again. So it's quite deliberate based on the psychology of uh, behavioral change in that each time, certainly in smoking, if we follow the Prochesca and Di Clemente model, each time a patient, an individual gives up, whether it's for a day, an hour, a day, a week, a year, if they fall off the wagon, if you like, if they lapse, the likelihood is that they will start again. And the more times they go around that cycle, the more likely they are to give up smoking. So it is our understanding of it not being failures, but it being repeated attempts. And probably the best way or the easiest way to think about smoking and, um, and behavioral change and behavioral change for health and why habit formation is difficult is to look at the Susan Mitchie's model where she describes it as the as a the model for the change, which is probably the most simple one to look at. If we think about um, asking somebody to 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 take on a new health benefit to behave, behavior, such as cleaning incidentally, such as giving up smoking, do they have the capability? Are they motivated to do it? And just as importantly, is there the opportunity to evoke that behavior? Now, some of you will recognize that from NCIS, for those of you that are uh, avid watchers and listeners of um, crime series, to create the, the, the crime, to, to be actually indicated that it could be you, you had to have the capability of committing it, you had to be motivated to do it, and you had to have the opportunity. So from judicial law, this very simple model can be applied when we start thinking about encouraging patients to give up smoking and working with them and understanding why e-cigarettes have become so incredibly powerful. Let's quickly look at um, tobacco legislation, because when I started out here, I talk, we spoke about the reduction in smoking globally and, and the summary of the Global of Burden Disease teams suggests that actually what is working is taxing, is ban on advertising and support to help quit. So let's have a look at what's happening on legislation. Well, track and trace didn't just start with COVID. I promised myself I wouldn't mention that. We're getting fairly fed up with COVID here in the UK, as I'm sure the rest of us are. Oh, stay safe out there. Um, but track and trace started uh, many years ago under the European track it, uh, Tobacco Directive, where uh, we made it quite difficult to um, to keep trace, keep track on uh, the use of tobacco in Europe. So we've introduced microprints into the paper that wrap up cigarettes. We put chemical markers in the tips of cigarettes. They have unique codes on their packaging so that we can trace them from source right way through the supply chain. Checking for uh, com uh, compliance with regulations on packaging, compliance on standards and compliance on the content of cigarettes. The directive came in to remove flavours of tobacco, so therefore uh, reducing their um, desirability by some people that, 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 that perhaps wouldn't like the, the, the taste of tobacco itself, but quite like the minty thought, quite like the fruit thought of tobacco. Uh, but the removal of flavours comes into force across the board uh, from mid-2021. So again, trying to switch off all of the keys that get patients or get individuals to wish to smoke, make it less desirable. In terms of the law and public opinion, we restrict laws on smoking um, in many, many countries where they can't smoke in public places, can't smoke in their own cars if they've got children in them. Um, advertising, banning the use of advertising at, to, it, and inappropriate targeting has worked very well for, um, for Europe. And putting this into the public health forum is also extremely powerful where we have a system, it's certainly in the United Kingdom, called Every Contact, Ma Every Contact Matters. So whereby when we see patients in the dental um, uh, arena, we make we we supply public health messages now be that on healthy diets on taking their uh, minimum of seven um, fruit and veg portions a day whether it is reducing the sugar whether it is reducing alcohol public health 
uh, joined up public health does work. So if you start to look back at Susan Mitch's model of behaviour, we start thinking about motivation. We're keying in motivation. We are reducing the opportunity for patients to smoke, for individuals to smoke. It's not convenient, it's not, and it's jolly chilly to go and stand outside in the smoking shack. We make it uncomfortable. I hope some of us are feeling slightly um, kinder towards our smokers who are now set out in the cold to do their smoking. Um, it is not an acceptable habit. So it's no longer cool, is it? It's no longer cool to be out there smoking. And um, we don't accept this as being an acceptable face anymore. We don't like to see individuals smoking. We don't like to see them in the street smoking, in open spaces even. We will, I'm sure you, many of you like me have been walking behind somebody in the high street that's lit up a cigarette and had to cross the road because they're in my space with their tobacco. And so it has become undesirable in many areas of the globe but out of that and you know forgive the the advert here but the growth of the electronic cigarette has been because of this downward pressure on making smoking less and less desirable and as our understanding of the role of smoking on on our general health generally pervades through the population the pressure is on to give up but they're addicted so the new face of smoking Where's this come in all of these years? We, have, we estimate there's 55 million users of electronic cigarettes throughout the globe. So it's not the small number of patients we're talking about here, everyone. Now it's time for you to have a think again. Just only one bash at it, um, thinking about the three aspects of smoking, um, which were, I can hear you shouting at me, hopefully as enthusiastically as, habit addiction and the psychological dependency. I'd like you to have a quick think now about three positive things you may or may not know about smoking in the a cigarettes, if you can think of three, and three negatives that you may, uh, that you, you know or, or have heard about it. So if you put those to one side, have a shuffle in your head, and let's try and dispel this as we go through. Normally we, I split the room and we all have a vote and a big discussion. Today I'd just like you to think about it and maybe they will form part of your questions at the end of this presentation. To help and to, to start uh, to, to put, put this into perspective, I think it'd be very uh, useful to start where, where the global impression is here on smoking. I think what and use of e-cigarettes as part of smoking cessation there's there's little common ground in in the health organizations globally but a false a falsy here is that all cigarettes contain nicotine they don't about 15 percent of all uk sales are nicotine free vaping um is considerably more effective than traditional nrt in helping patients to quit smoking and the latest um uh, meta-analysis using the Cochrane uh, database um, showed that that was the case. It doubles and sometimes trebles the time, largely because the, this, re this nicotine replacement is in the control of the individual. It's not considered pharmacotherapy that's not being done to, but we do know that patients do better when they're um, using e-cigarettes to give up smoking for good. Another falsy is that a secondary vaping is an issue. It, it isn't like um, secondary smoking, whereby we do know it has a deleterious health effect on those in and around you in a regular, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, secondary vaping, we have no data uh, that would support that. Where, what we do know is where there's an absence of regulation, there remains and it's not just a significant amount of doubt about their relative safety. And I'll, I'll, I Show you the global map on where it's regulated and where it isn't and where and it relates to you where, where you're practicing and another big one that comes up constantly is that uh, for those anti-cigarettes the, the, the anti-tobacco campaigners say that actually by by encouraging allowing accepting e-cigarettes and vapes we're renormalizing smoking there's no evidence for that either it's just renormalizing vaping those people those of you who've seen the vapes in action look it looks nothing like smoking it looks quite bizarre for those of us that have never smoked and, and never vaped so when you first start seeing patients using these in their cloud of vapor uh, or aerosol as it actually is uh, it's slightly odd is it not 
here's where they're legal and I'm not so. So um, here it, you find yourselves on the map here where we see the red zones where electronic cigarettes are banned. We see the highest rates of smoking, not unsurprisingly. That's traditional tobacco smoking and tobacco use, not just in smoked combustion cigarettes, cigars, pipes, uh, but also used um, in the oral mucosa as uh, pan, as kainy uh, in some areas. Um, yeah, so it's general use. Where we see the restrictions, and this is a sort of an overarching orange area you've got here, the restrictions vary per state in the United, United States and per country with the most regulation uh, probably sitting in Europe and some parts of Australia. Not a great uh, uh, pixelated slide here, sorry about that everyone, but it does clearly, I thought because of this global uh, application today and we're looking at the Southern Hemisphere because of the time of day, I thought this would be helpful for you there, banned or seriously restricted in these areas. So in came the e-cigarette then. What is it? It started looking slightly dodgy like a pretend plastic cigarette and they were in fact precisely that. Um, what is, is consistent with them all is they contain a battery, uh, a heating plate and a solution that's heated up and is, as it heats it's, um, it pr produces an aerosol and what you see uh, what patients inhale is the aerosol that comes in from this, this cigarette. Some light up at the end Funnily enough, but let's have a quick look at their history. And it is a brief history of their brief history because they haven't been around that long. So it started with a Chinese company uh, and the chemist involved, uh, Hon Lick, was actually invented this or, or set about producing um, the first electronic cigarette because he had to stand by and see his father die of his 40 a day smoking habit and knew that there had to be a way, a pharmacological way, a better way of delivering nicotine in a way that would, um, negate all the other 400 or so other known carcinogens in, in combusted tobacco. We first had e-cigarettes in the United Kingdom in 2007, came in largely unregulated, though we, we knew they were on the way, that was our fault. Um, and the first national surveys that we're starting with, that I'm putting all this data from, didn't start to 2011. So don't forget, we're only talking about 10 years of data here. We talked about the smoking um, habit in the UK of being all just under 7 million. Well, we have uh, just under 4 million um, vapors as of 2019 figures. Uh, it would be interesting to see that the, the effects of lockdown on um, vaping and smoking in the United Kingdom, we won't start to see that data, obviously, um, and for another 18 months. But it'll be interesting to see whether the uh, perceived uh, boost in health benefiting behaviours that COVID has, has and, and ill behaviours that COVID has instigated. It'd be interesting to see the, that on the figures for smoking and vaping. I think probably one of the most uh, alarming or maybe reassuring, depends which side you of the camp we're on on this, is that most of the uh, tobacco, the e-cigarette um, brands now are owned by the multinationals. No big surprise there when you start to think about if we're regulating something, regulation costs money and it's usually only the big players that can afford to jump uh, the hoops and meet the standards that are being required by legislation for the safe delivery of vapes and electronic cigarettes. And in terms of it's worth lots of money, uh, nearer 43 billion worldwide is the estimate for 2022. So, but the data and the stuff I'd like you to look more specifically at is this 48%. They're the numbers of patients and that say, or individuals that say they use it as part of quitting. And that holds out across the globe. Patients that are moving from combustible tobacco in part or in full see electronic cigarettes as healthier. I use that term very lightly here. They see it as um, less expensive, for sure it is. And they see it as a way of quitting uh, tobacco, which they know is not good for them. But if we look at the prevalence data uh, just across Europe, um, then we still, and globally actually, uh, in some parts here, males are, are the biggest uptakers of electronic cigarettes. It's highest by far in existing smokers, so they're the ones that smoke and vape, and in our ex-smokers. For the United Kingdom, the vapors, uh, in terms of total vaping number, account for about 15 to 18 percent. So they've 
come 18% of the smokers that are using vapes have come off tobacco altogether. We do see um, the use of, of electronic cigarettes in our young adults and we do see it in, in adolescents. We're not seeing it in any higher levels than we would have taken up smoking, but we do still see this. And if you think about what does it look like for those of us that have that never uh, had the opportunity to get our mitts on, on, on some of these, it started off as a cigarette, but it's certainly um, moved on. And they're sometimes known as pipes, the middle one, and mods. So it's a modulated format. So they, they, they've moved from looking like a cigarette to looking like something slightly odd. Uh, so the first generation, as we've spoken, did, did have a little light on the end, and that's still available. Actually, if you go, uh, I can, when we're allowed out, if we go in slightly dodgy areas of town, I can still find these on card-mounted blister packs, and they cost about 75 pence, and pr pr proposed to be the equivalent of a packet of 20 cigarettes. The second generation, more like a pipe, it's uh, more personalised. This uh, contains a battery, again, the same, the chamber for the liquid and a tank where you can customise the contents. And therein, when it first arrived in, in our country and still in countries where this is unregulated, which is a large swathe of the globe, the tank is for customising the contents. So you don't necessarily get proprietary ready mixed. You can mix your own. Therein lies the problem. Many do have adjustable settings in this format, so you can turn it up and turn it down, and that's when you see these wild um, clouds of vapour and aroma around individuals and the games that are actually available to watch if you so choose on YouTube on Chasing the Dragon. That's not quite as, as sinister as it, it sounds in terms of uh, substance misuse, or perhaps it is, but it's a competition, a global competition to see how well you can vape and how, how far you can get your aroma. Um, and how, what, what shapes you can form with it. Whole new world, everyone, whole new world. But this was the second generation and still used and preferred by smokers. Third generation is, is the mod, larger still. It's a much more powerful battery with an adjustable voltage. It comes with a puff counter. So built into it, you can tell how many you've puffed and uh, per day. And it's you can monitor your use of the, the product. This speaks to, the, to our generation that like to, to, to self-monitor. And let's face it, we've all become the Fitbit users, wearers to see how many steps we've done a day. This plays into the psychological aspect of smoking and con habit control, where the individual is not just aware of what they're doing, aware of how, how much they're vaping, they have total control about recording it too. So it, it works quite well for um, long-time smokers. And we tend to see the older generations now using this, this the, the mod here, here in the UK. A relatively new new uh, chapter here was the development by um, Philips uh, um, Imperial and Imperial Tobacco, and it's the Jewel. Looks very much like a cigarette packet, don't forget. And essentially, because it's a USB uh, on, on a stick. Uh, this caused an awful lot of controversy in the United States. Is this the latest iPhone equivalent for vapes? Yes, it is. Um, it caused, uh, caused a lot of controversy because of its discretion. You can tuck it quietly somewhere, get your little hit uh, without anybody really knowing. And they were looking at young adolescents using these, finding these and being able to use them in a school environment. It was a small piece of research, but it was shocking enough to hit the, paid, the, hit the papers. What do jewels claim? They say it's simple, they say it's clean, they say it's satisfying. Um, you know, all slightly questionable uh, name, uh, words to associate with something that is a, essentially a drug. But it's easier to use than the uh, paraphernalia associated with the electronic cigarettes and liquid. There's no messy stuff there. Um, and it's satisfying as much as because of what they've put in it, how, how they, they how they've redesigned the contents. So they they are actually targeting uh, long time users of tobacco smoke for this. And another one is the heated tobacco. Now the IQOS, I Q O S. Again, this is by um, uh, the Philips Empire. This was released in Japan initially, and it's heated tobacco, so not, not, a, not a solution, not nicotine or flavours and glycol in a solution, but it is tobacco itself that's heated on a plate. It has a, a battery, a lithium battery associated with it. It heats it. It does release particulates, but it gives a, a slightly different hit. This hasn't, this hasn't become very popular, certainly for the in Europe. 
uh, because we regulate for e-cigarettes where it did become and is still quite popular is over in Japan where they have banned electronic cigarettes so um, when you start to look at the data for sales it did come into the UK but it's it's sold infrequently In terms of how much these things cost, and we talked about uh, regulation and taxation, for a second, for those pipes, it's about £20. The third generation, anywhere between 30 and 300 The liquids, the content themselves, are about £3 per 10 mils. And overall, uh, e-cigarette e use, electronic cigarette use for the United Kingdom and for many parts of Europe ranges between 40 and 70% cheaper, 65% cheaper at the moment with the going rate. The hardware does require some replacement, and so you do. It's, it, there's a bit of upkeep involved in those mods. And if you go back to that psychological element we spoke about, and they, they, you have a, a little a piece of kit that you you not only require to top up, top up, customize the contents, you're also required to keep it in full working order. So there's a lot of uh, maintenance involved in looking after these, and that goes back to this psychological dependency where they have control. Those of you that may have grandpas or, or uh, relatives that smoked pipes, pipe tobacco, if you can recall the enormous amount of time and effort spent by, by those individuals in keeping their pipe clean and poking pipe cleaners down it and tapping out the contents of the bowl in your mother's plant pot normally. Um, but that kind of involvement in this habit serves to make it such, make it a, a compliance habit. So therefore, when we talk about smoking cessation, when you've got a piece of kit that requires the same time, attention to detail, it works on the psychological aspect, the patients moving away from smoking, but into something that not only do they uh, get their nicotine hit from, but they also spend time uh, looking after. The dual pod starter kits around 30 pounds, but still equates to a 42% reduction in, uh, in the cost of smoking for the United Kingdom. But what's in them? Nicotine, I did say at the start of this, about 15% for the UK sales uh, consistently over the past three years have been with no milligrams of nicotine at all. So this is somebody just using it for the flavour, but it's up to and regulated to 20 milligrams per mil. The flavourings that are used range from tobacco to fruit flavours. Now, uh, the most commonly used um, flavour for ex-smokers and people giving up is the tobacco flavour. And it's within six to eight weeks, they tend to move away from that as they find it um, unpleasant and move into the fruit flavours. And the most popular of which for, for smokers that continue to smoke and use a vape or smokers that move from completely no smoking into vaping tend to be the wood flavours and a blueberry is, is, is the most popular here. Uh, flavouring is also quite contentious, a bit like Alco Pops in terms of encouraging uh, new users to the market. Why would you have a Toffee Fuji flavour electronic cigarette if you were not trying to entice people with a, a sweet tooth, predominantly younger people? Um, why would you label them the ultimate hit. So things like legislation to protect uh, and to be quite clear on what these products are is really important. The liquid that carries the uh, it, uh, this flavoring and the nicotine in, in the majority of vapes is, probably, is propylene, propylene glycol, and it's either synthetic or vegetable origin. And, it, and often it glycerin in the cheaper variants. For the iPod, interestingly, the nicotine doesn't come in its uh, excipient solution. It comes as a nicotine salt. And it also takes with it a benzoic acid. Now, benzoic acid is part of the tobacco plant itself. And when it's combined with the nicotine salts, it gives a faster hit. So if we go back to my comment about it looking like a packet of cigarettes, it does that from a marketing perspective because it wishes to target the people that are, that are um, smokers. So moving into vaping. So the benzoic acid and the nicotine salts to combine to give it quite an a impactful hit of nicotine, very similar to that of smoking itself. They do have flavours, uh, but the range of flavours is much smaller and they stick to the woody flavours that, that appeal to smokers and ex-smokers. So that's our sort of whistle gabble through at what's happening out there uh, in terms of you know how we view nicotine and how we view uh, electronic cigarettes in the in the dental setting and in the healthcare setting. Uh, certainly from the United Kingdom's perspective and public health perspective, it's 
actually using nicotine as part of the solution here. We know it's the one thing that patients need uh, that want, and so by giving it to them in a in a less harmful, not safe, less harmful way is maybe part of the solution here. And maybe accept that its lifetime use is, is less harmful than smoking itself. Coffee is addictive. Uh, we accept coffee. It doesn't have the same deleterious effect on the on the body, but it, but it is an addictive uh, substance. But I guess this is where we're going uh, in terms of today. Um, what do we know about its long-term use? It hasn't been long around long enough to know that. So how do we feel about that? How, how, where do we go from here? Well, certainly I can speak from, the, from our perspective in the United Kingdom, where as dental care professionals, we're required to make every contact count. And in harm reduction guidelines, it's about getting patients to, encouraging patients to reduce the amount of um, tobacco or cut out tobacco, preferably, but to reduce the amount of cigarettes if they're smoking. Um, and so when we start to look at the issues for e-cigarettes, it is about the content and qualification. We've regulated quite strongly, albeit quite late in the day. We look to legislation to help uh, facilitate patients wishing to give up smoking using electronic cigarettes. They can buy in the United Kingdom over the counter nicotine replacement patches, et cetera, but unfortunately the cost of those are the same as their smoking habit. So to give your gift for a smoker that didn't wish to use e-cigarettes, but wish to give up smoking and go for nicotine replacement therapy, but not go under the medical guise of going through a smoking cessation clinic, I would be paying the same for my NRT as I would for my, my habit. So you can see that actually by favoring um, legislation and taxation around e-cigarettes, we're leaning towards patients taking control for themselves of their, of their habit. MHRA have limited um, to 12 milligrams per, per, per milliliter as the safe dose in terms of the vials. The uh, European uh, Tobacco Directive has put legislation on content and tamper proofing. So they, the packaging these come in have to be tamper proof and they have to be minimized in terms of their milliliter dose. So very well regulated. Um, and if you're supporting patients to give up uh, or I would never recommend patients give up elect take on electronic cigarettes, but I would certainly support them in giving up. And if and in that support would be my advice to seek the advice of other allied healthcare professionals and go to reputable stores to purchase these, where the vaping shops staff are, are extremely well briefed and extremely helpful in getting the patients, getting the individuals the best possible um, type of e-cigarette to help them. If we start to really look at the at the issues, it is about target audience here. Who's being targeted here? And if we've got the multinational tobacco companies, they need an outlet for their for their product. And whether it is in combustible tobacco or whether it is in an electronic cigarette, the cynics among us wouldn't be terribly happy um, to know that they they own these brands. But but on conversely, by owning them and being rich brands, they are able to regulate them. They are able to meet the guidelines for their safety. So we need to think about the issues of toxicity for the individual, toxicity to the, to the tissues. We need to think about, are we encouraging a vape culture? And you know, what are the excipients in these flavorings and, and what are the long-term effects of those? And how can legislation play more of a part from us sitting here in practice every day and going back into practice tomorrow morning, from, from if we think about the economics of health, smoking is clearly an expensive uh, cost of burden uh, globally. So in terms of our support is about getting patients to reduce the number of cigarettes, record what they're doing, ask them as part of their social history, what, whether they're using cigarettes or electronic cigarettes and encourage them to cut down maybe replacing with electronic cigarettes or another form of NRT, nicotine replacement therapy, but our end goal as healthcare professionals, for me at least, has to be stopping altogether. The end goal would be to stop them using this. If I think, if I look towards the United Kingdom and, and we look at the uh, support that we have in the public health sector, 
So the British Heart Foundation supports their, their, their patients and their members in using electronic cigarettes and promotes it as a, as a, I don't like the term safer alternative. I think the term should be less harmful alternative. If I look at the, um, the data, if we now look at the, the data of the more harmful contents that we've become aware of, I quite often in an open question scenario get asked, does this cause popcorn lung? Popcorn lung is actually a, a condition that was, that was traced, an occupational health condition that was traced from the butter kiss factories in the United States in the days when there wasn't adequate ventilation, in the days when um, uh, mass production in poorly ventilated and long hour, long working hours in a, in a popcorn making factory, it was actually deemed that the butterscotch flavor was the problem. The flavoring that was inherent in the air for long-term workers caused a problem Became corp became known as popcorn lung, and we started to see something similar going on in terms of the physiology and damage to lungs in areas of the United States. And this condition uh, is known as uh, Ivali, which is predominantly was found in in young individuals, adolescents, and young adults. And it's e-cigarette vaping um, use associated with lung injury, and it was down to uh, the vitamin E acetate. Vitamin E acetate is a thickening agent and it's required for cannabis containing um, products to liquidize the cannabis oil. So for the United States, these cases, we had 57 uh, fatalities in the, the, by the early part of 2019. It was all in younger people and it was all in the states where the cannabis oil was is, is legal tender for use. And when put into what we've discovered is when it's put into an electronic cigarette, when it's heated and it's it's the, and the aerosol is inhaled, it damages the lungs. That has now been um, barred as a substance that can be used in in vapes uh, in the US. So, having said all that, we still don't know the long term effects of inhaled aerosols, and we have starting to see certainly in vitro some research that looks at it tar it seems to target the perio ligament now anecdotally when patients come off of smoking and move into vaping we see an immediate response of the tissue returning to that of a no smoker why we see that in the first six to eight weeks of a patient giving up smoking and moving to electronic cigarettes is unclear is it because there's no damage is it because the masking of the other carcinogens and toxic um, components that could combusted tobacco are removed? We, we still don't know, the jury's out, but um, later data uh, is suggesting certainly um, that it, it's, that the, is it a wolf in sheep's clothing? I'm not quite sure. But um, in terms of asking for reference, and there's loads of data out there, you'll be pleased to hear, conflicting always, small data, things that don't merge that well. But what we're starting to see, certainly in this piece of research, looks at um, when we're looking at it in the lab, we're seeing oxidative stress in the tissue. We're certainly seeing some DNA damage. We certainly see the inflammatory mediators and markers being increased uh, when exposed to the excipients of electronic cigarette aerosol. We're seeing dysregulated repair. When we start to, again to look at um, the, the broader research by Cap and et al, this is a nice piece of nice paper and an, a, a, a reasonable read, well laid out for us to look at from an oral health perspective and underpin what we think and what we now know. We're starting to see um, changes to the gingival health. We do know that components of the, the vapor have cytotoxic and carcinogenic properties, but whether that isn't enough to cause long-term damage, it, the jury is still out. But we do know that switching from conventional smoking to vaping, it does mitigate the other all effects of smoke to pack tobacco. In terms of uh, its, its car, um, carcinogenic properties, it's too soon. But what this paper did say helpfully is that we it, it could instigate a wider uh, problem area for oral health. Uh, not least uh, erosion, not least caries, because of the constituents of some of the uh, e-cigarettes solutions that are available now because of the flavouring. 
if we start to look a little bit more close at home, what research do we have on implants? So not forgetting that combustible smoke, uh, depending on the research you look at, can, can mean that an implant is five times more likely to fail than in a non-smoker. Where are we with um, our understanding of the effects, the relative effects of e-cigarettes on, on implant uh, maintenance or implant uh, life? Well, looking at the research that's, that's starting to come out, we're, the, the oral, we're starting to see a reduction in the cell viability, certainly in the lab. And we do, there, there's some clear evidence now about eight papers looking at the increase in epithelial cell thickness. So uh, it would indicate that we have, there is a problem there, but the jury is, is out, I'm afraid, on that. For the United Kingdom, we've just seen this, and for those of us that are in, in this area, um, we started for the first time to see the Scandic origin um, tobacco pouches, SNUS, as it's known in, in Scandinavia. Many of you will be familiar with it. We're starting to see it in the UK too. So this is a, I've shown here, it's a horrendous photograph. I took it on the back of a toilet door. Should I be saying that at this hour in the morning for the UK? I did because uh, we, there were strong moves to keep this out of the United Kingdom, but we're starting to see it sold quite regularly. Uh, again, under the restrictions of tobacco, um, uh, of, of, a, of a device. So it's under, uh, no under 18s, but it's marketed quite freely here now. I have seen little or no data uh, in terms of its uptake and sales in the United Kingdom, but I'll be keeping a close watch on this one. So to reassure us, does it reassure us? Have I given you any reassurance? I think um, if we look at uh, the controversial statement from the Public Health England, whereby we're supporting the use of electronic cigarettes as part of giving up smoking, we this is their statement. Oh, and, it, and it's true, it, is, it does appear that as we've lost all of the really damaging elements of combustor smoke, it's got to be less damaging. I, I, I veer away from the word healthier and I veer away from the word safer. I think the, the, the word I'm more comfortable with when talking about this is saying it, it, it appears to be less damaging. And for the United Kingdom at least, um, it is, we're asked to be open about people wishing to give up smoking, especially those who've tried and failed with other, other techniques. And so we see this here uh, as an additional tool in, in the kit bag to help patients eventually give up its use. I think it's quite clear that most pa many, many patients do find this a way, a, a fully controllable way of giving up smoking, but it does leave them hooked on nicotine and let's not forget the uh, the fuss that the medical profession made when it was first suggested that we, we we support patients wishing to give up tobacco by giving them nicotine itself but look how far we've come we've moved from the days of the 1960s where we had a 42 percent smoking rate in the united kingdom to now at 14 percent so the use of of nicotine as part of smoking cessation does work to drive down uh, combusted smoking habits uh, whether it's long-term use in an aerosol is, um, is, is desirable, is yet to be seen. Some useful references here, which I'm very happy to place in a PDF to make available to all the registrants of this, uh, and along with all the latest Kaplan data I'll put, on, I'll put on the post for you. Now I'm going to uh, unshare my screen now and talk to you and ask some questions everyone if you're still with me and haven't glazed over completely I'll stop sharing my screen so do you have any questions for me i have some questions for you i could ask you if you've remembered the three aspects of smoking uh but let's talk about so please do uh, drop me a line i'll be really happy to ask any questions and obviously and, and subsequently if you find uh that you've reflected on this and like to think about it and please do to do get and get in touch through tp uh, and i'll endeavor to answer those for you i have a question here asking uh, about the uptake in in children regulation there is some data um, and it, it depends on the country that you're looking at so if i look let's have a look at my data for sweden so for sweden um the 
if we look at the uh, the uptake of of, of e-cigarettes, particularly in Sweden, where don't forget snus is 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 um, uh, used widely, and smoking isn't as 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 high as it is in in some parts of Europe. So we they look. There are two pieces of data there looking at. Um, just sort of 300 uh, individuals. So, for in, in Sweden, uh, the the individuals, youngsters, so that's between 15 and 21, uh, that take on e-cigarettes, they're more likely to use the nicotine variant. So, nicotine at uh, the low dosage. If you compare that with the same number of and the same age group, because it's quite difficult to get these comparisons, but if we compare uh, the same number, the same age group for Holland, for example those the same age group are far less likely to use um, nicotine containing electronic devices so it depends the country that you're looking at but we are seeing absolutely uh, this being taken up in adolescence it seems the cool thing to do uh, but no in no higher numbers I think it's quite important here in, in no higher numbers than we're seeing in them taking on cigarettes there is an element of risk, there's an element of danger, an element of adulthood in this behaviour that I don't think that we'll always see. We do see it more highly in, 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 in boys than we do in girls, uh, but it's following the same trajectory and pattern. This will, all, this will always be about regulation. This will always be about how we deal um, with inquiries um, um, from from individuals, and this will be about how we legislate and protect individuals. We're showing, certainly in the parts of the globe where e-cigarettes are regulated well, that they can be used, put to good use, but it requires regulation and requires understanding. I have a question. Thank you very much. I have a question um, that do do we see litigation? uh certainly i can only speak about uk judicial law if at the time that we're giving advice to patients we're not in, i'm not encouraging a patient to take on electronic uh use of e-cigarettes e um so all the evidence that we have to date at the time that we have right now it appears to be less damaging than their smoking habits so would i recommend e-cigarettes the answer is no would i support patients wishing to give up smoking use and e using an e-cigarette the answer is definitely yes uh, because all the evidence we have to date means that they are removing from their lives and the lives of, of others around them that live with them uh, the known effects, carcinogenic effects of tobacco, combusted tobacco. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that one. Okay, well, it is uh, start of my day and time for your suppers and for many of you watching uh, this evening, joining us this evening. I'd like to thank you again for joining us uh, and taking part in this. At the, when you close down, you will find that uh, another screen pops up, and that's the evaluation we spoke about. So I will just switch back away from me. You'll be pleased to hear. And just do your gentle reminder uh, that the evaluation should pop up after we close the meeting today if you could complete that for us that does help us develop these for this tp share platform and your opinion does count for us uh, we can only improve these uh, if with with help and input from yourself so thank you very much for joining have a lovely evening everybody for those of you in the southern hemisphere uh, i might consider going out for a jolly chilly jog uh, before i start my day so thank you all very much for joining us we look forward to seeing you back on the tp platform in future so check out uh, the uh, other presentations that are available. We'd love to see you. Thank you very much. Bye.